Good day everyone, I am Jay Inamarga and we will be discussing radiation safety training in MMC today. This lecture material was made possible through the efforts of the Medical Radiation Protection Committee and the subject matter experts Laura Cruz, Joel Molina, and yours truly. So without further ado, let's get this show rolling. So basically, we'll be discussing radiation safety and how we can better protect ourselves when dealing with radiation. These will be the topics that will be covered in this lecture. I'll do my best to simplify the concepts. So these are radiation, radiation protection principles, biological effects of ionizing radiation, and radiation safety in Makati Medical Center. Let's first define the word radiation. Radiation, by definition, is the energy propagated through space in the form of electromagnetic waves or moving particles. So we have two types. We have non-ionizing and ionizing radiation. However, our focus in this lecture will be on ionizing radiation only. So basically, let's define these two types of radiation. So for the first one, just a brief overview. Non-ionizing radiation, it's a type of low energy radiation that does not have enough energy to remove an electron from an atom or molecule. On the other hand, an ionizing uh, radiation is a form of energy that acts by removing electrons from atoms and molecules of materials that may include air, water, and living tissue. Also, ionizing radiation can travel unseen and pass through these materials. And here, uh, this is basically just a nice um, picture on how we see the separation of non-ionizing and ionizing radiation. So on the left side, we have power lines, radio and TV waves, cell phones, and microwaves. On the right side, we have the ionizing radiation, and this will be our focus for today's video. So now that we know the definition of radiation, let's talk about the three types of radiation. So we have three, we have alpha, beta, and gamma. So for the first one, alpha particles, which are found on smoke detectors and can easily be shielded by a piece of paper, is the first type. So we can see the ionization abil ability and how penetrating it is. So between the three, it's the, least uh, it's the least penetrating, but it has the highest ionization ability. Next, we have beta particles, which would require a certain thickness of plastic or aluminum to be stopped. Now, beta radiation emitters can be used as tracers in medicine to image, in, uh, to image the inside of our body and can also be used for cancer treatment. So most prominent example of a beta emitter in Makati Medical Center would be the iodine-131 that we use for our radioactive iodine therapy. Lastly, we have the gamma rays or x-rays. So basically they can travel, uh, they can travel long distances through air or penetrate tissue and they're mostly used for diagnostic purposes. But they have the least ionization ability, but they are the most penetrating. Moreover, it can also be used to sterilize medical equipment and can also help sterilize packaged foods. Also, gamma rays would require uh, several feet of concrete or several inches of lead to be stopped. So those are the most effective shielding materials for a gamma emitter. Now let's talk about the natural sources of radiation in our planet. So radiation source, uh, sources are everywhere from the sun, from the plants, from the food that we eat, and from the ground. And we are exposed on a daily basis. So if there are natural sources, we have also what we call man-made or artificial sources of radiation. So it could be uh, in the form of conventional diagnostic x-rays, industrial radiography, radiation therapy for cancer treatment, 
and as discussed earlier, used in smoke detectors. So these are the different uses of uh, man-made radiation sources. So we have nuclear reactors, uses in medicine, food and agriculture, industry, household uses, nuclear weapons, definitely, archaeology, and geology. So now that we have an idea of the definition and the types and uses of radiation and their sources, let's move on to the next important topic for this lecture. So you see these three words, justification, optimization, and those limits. We'll talk about this in detail in the succeeding slides. So basically, these three words that you see, they represent the principles of radiation protection. And this is one of the most important topics in this lecture. Let's start with justification. In simple terms, the benefits of using ionizing radiation should outweigh the risks. So some scenarios wherein justification applies, basically we have exposure to ionizing radiation of a pregnant woman, animal research, or bracket therapy. Next, we have the optimization principle which goes together with the acronym ALARA or as low as reasonably achievable. So what do we mean by this ALARA principle? It means that the likelihood of incurring exposures, the number of people exposed, and the magnitude of their individual doses should all be kept as low as reasonably achievable, taking into account economic and societal factors. And how do we achieve this ALARA principle? We basically look at employing time, distance, and shielding. So let's talk about them one by one. For time, this one is pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, the less time spent near a radioactive source, the less radiation you receive. For the second one, the greater the distance from the source, the less radiation you receive. And for the, uh, for the last one, behind the shielding from the source or using appropriate shielding material, take note of the term appropriate shielding material, the less radiation you will receive. So to summarize, and in actual practice, we follow these precautions and practice to the best of our abilities. So for the first one, employing time, basically when caring for patients who have undergone radioactive iodine therapy, we limit the time spent inside the patient's room, and whenever possible, we implement staff rotation to dilute the exposure. For the second one, whenever possible, we always maximize the distance from the source of exposure. And to minimize radiation exposure, we do not unnecessarily stay inside an area containing a radioactive source. So basically, if you don't have any business being in that room or in that area, then we don't really stay there for long. Next, to ensure safety, this one is a common scenario in the emergency room and the, in the ward. The rat tech will shout twice to notify the public that an exposure will be done to a patient. Lastly, for the shielding, in order to maximize protection by our staff, we use personal radiation protective devices in the form of lead gown, thyroid shield, or gonadal shield. And doors should be always closed during examination of the patient. And for the radiation workers, they are always required to wear their personal dose monitoring. And if they don't have a personal dose monitoring device, they have to be um, assisted by an authorized personnel first. So those are the two principles of radiation protection. So we have justification and um, optimization. Now let's talk about the last one. So we have this dose limits and this principle only applies to radiation workers and not the patients. So we will discuss briefly the dose limits for the different parts of the body for both radiation workers and general public. Again, dose limits help ensure that no person is exposed to an excessive amount of ionizing radiation 
in normal planned situations. And this is also the strongest form of restriction of dose to an individual. Exceeding a dose limit is contrary to regulations in most countries, especially in the Philippines. So here we see an image detailing the dose limits of each part of the body as well as the whole body. So basically for the lens of the eye, for the workers, you can receive up until 20 millisieverts in one year and for the public, 15 millisieverts. For the whole body, the limit for the radiation workers is 20 millisieverts and for the public, it's just one millisievert per year. For the skin and extremities, for the workers, you can receive up, um, uh, or rather the limit is 500 millisieverts and the public has an annual limit of 50 millisieverts. Now, we move on to the next topic wherein we discuss the radiation safety culture inside Makati Medical Center and how we utilize the benefits of ionizing radiation while limiting harm to all our stakeholders. So just a brief background, we have different radiation emitting medical equipment in Makati Med. We have for diagnostic, C-arm x-ray, portable x-ray, fluoroscopic equipment, computer tomography, and the latest one would be the PET CT equipment. For therapy, we have two tomotherapy equipment and one brachytherapy equipment. So exposure to these equipment will not leave the patient radioactive except for our latest imaging modality, which is a PET imaging equipment. Now for this slide, we looked at the different radioactive sources in Makati Med. So we have brachytherapy and we also have radioactive materials in nuclear medicine and PET imaging center. For brachytherapy, it's a type of sealed source wherein there's very minimal chance of leakage and the patient does not become radioactive. For nuclear medicine and PET imaging center, however, the patient becomes radioactive because we administer small amounts of unsealed sources or radioactive materials called radiopharmaceutical. So when caring for our uh, radioactive patients, especially for those administered with therapeutic amount of iodine-131, it is not advisable to wear lead gowns due to the possible generation of bram lung x-rays. So the most or rather the most advisable tip that we can give to our personnel would be to apply time and distance guidelines so that they can minimize radiation exposure while performing their duties to our RAI patients. So now we move on to the radiation protection procedures wherein our goal is to minimize the risk of unnecessary radiation exposure to our patients and of course to our staff as well. So the first one is avoid repetition. So how do we do this? We do this by observing proper radiography techniques such as proper choice of exposure factors, correct positioning of the patient, and proper instruction to the patient. So before you hit that exposure button, always ensure that the patient is positioned correctly and that proper instructions were given to the patient. Now for the second one, we look at limiting the exposure to the area of clinical interest only. So organs that are not included in the examination should not be subjected to exposure. So there are certain devices to help us achieve this and also there are techniques that can be used by the staff prior to exposure. In the case of our staff, gonad shields, thyroid shields, abdominal shields, lead gown, lead barrier, they are readily available just in case they have the need to use it. And also the use of personal dosimeters such as ring badge and TLD or OSL are extremely important when they're performing their duties. For the third one, we always ensure the status of our female patients. So signages for pregnant patients are posted in areas where all patients are able to read. 
effective communication with the, with the patient prior to the procedure to confirm if she is pregnant or not should always be part of our culture. Now, in case there are hazardous material spills, here are MMC's protocols. So for the first part, let's talk about a minor spill. So first responder of the unit applies three C's, caution, call, and contain. So there are different types. We could either be chemical, biological, or radiological. So the steps are pretty much straightforward. You can just pause this video and read through it, and then we'll proceed with the next one. For the Dr. Orange protocol, now this one is implemented during major spills or minor spills in identified high-risk units. So these are the Facilities Management and Engineering Division, Pathology and Laboratories, the ph uh, Pharmacy, Nuclear Medicine, and Pet Imaging Center. So the need to employ radiation protection procedures stem from the fact that we need to mitigate harm and to prevent further contamination. So when we say contamination, in the context of radiation protection, contamination is defined as the presence of radioactive substance or material on the surface or within solids, liquids, or gases where they are unintended. So radioactive material that has been deposited or found on or within a few centimeter of the surface of the ground or on the surface of other material where it is not intended can be counted as contamination. And we have different types of contamination. So for the first one, we have fixed contamination wherein it cannot be easily removed from the surface and it cannot be removed by casual contact, wiping, brushing, or washing. For the second one, we have a non-fixed contamination wherein it can be easily removed or transferred from surfaces and it may be removed through casual contact, wiping, brushing, or washing. So air movement may cause a removable contamination to become airborne. And this brings us to the third one wherein basically we have an airborne contamination and this one is suspended in air and may be carried into different ventilation systems such as our AHUs and whatnot. And then there's also the possibility that it can be released outside of our facility. So now that we have an idea of the different types of contamination, let's look at the different routes of contamination. So we just have two, external and internal. So you can just pause this video and go through the different um, external routes as well as the internal routes for your own convenience. Now for this part, basically it talks about how to deal with a minor spill or a spill incident in Makati Medical Center. So the steps are pretty much self-explanatory and we can just pause this video so that you can go through this one by one. The important thing is always notify your radiation protection officer or your immediate superior that a spill has occurred in your unit or in your center. Now for the second type of spill wherein a large amount or a major spill happen, the steps are again pretty much self-explanatory so in the interest of time you can just pause this video and go over them one by one. Again, I cannot stress this enough, the most important thing to do is always notify the radiation protection officer that a spill has occurred or if the radiation protection officer is not available, then his, next, his or her next designate should be informed immediately. That ends our radiation safety orientation. If you have questions or clarifications, you may reach out to our HRMDB Learning and Development Team for further assistance. Once again, this has been Jay Namarga. Thank you and stay safe always.